Hello and welcome to Perspectives, where we'll take a deep dive into the issues of the day and where we'll take a look at people's opinions on such issues. I am Ruth Osime. And I am Ola Torera Majakodumi Oniru. Today's topic is intimate partner violence, also known as domestic abuse. Special guests and very important discussions coming up, so please stay tuned to Perspectives on Arise News. Welcome back to Perspectives, you're on Arise News. <clears throat> Domestic violence is a pattern of coercive, controlling behavior that can include physical, emotional, psychological, sexual, or financial abuse. Some abusers are able to exert complete control over a victim's every action without ever using violence, but just the threats of it, which is equally as intimidating. Uncontrollable public display of temper tantrums also usually make outsiders aware of the problem. When physical assaults occur, they instill fear of future violent attacks and allow the abuser to take control of the victim's lives and circumstances. Such maltreatment can cause victims to feel isolation, fear, and distrust. Abusive partners make it very difficult for their victims to escape these relationships. Sadly, many survivors suffer from abuse have been suffering from abuse for decades. Domestic abuse has resulted in serious mental health issues, physical injury, and even death. These incidents are rarely isolated and usually escalate in frequency and severity. As a victim, you live in a constant state of alertness and anticipation waiting for the next attack to occur. This pervasive, life-threatening crime affects millions of individuals regardless of age, economic status, or educational level. This discussion of domestic violence is intended to educate the public about the dynamics of abuse in an intimate manner, or with an intimate partner, not to mention that of parents and children. It is to help victims understand their experience and give them the courage to do the needful, and also for family and friends to recognize signs of abuse in the relationships of their loved ones and learn how to rescue them from a bondage that can lead to death if care is not taken. Very well said. First comes love, then intimacy, abuse, violence, toxic hatred, then homicide. From dream husband to hell man, from trophy wife to scorned woman, the terror that many spouses, especially women, have lived in and continue to live in today are inhumanely unspeakable. From being born alive to being tied up in a room for days without food, water, or human contact. Many domestic violence cases end in murder, and 50% of women deaths worldwide are caused by domestic violence. We remember eight months pregnant mama Goodluck in Enugu, who was beaten to death by her husband for not providing dinner. Desiree Parnell shot in the head by her ex-boyfriend, Gabby Petito, strangled to death by her fiancé, Abimbola Ogbono, burned to death after a violent altercation with her husband, Alaba Bakare, murdered by his wife with a hot iron on his chest. And the one I'll never forget, pregnant Cherika Adams, murdered to death by her famous footballer boyfriend who did not want the child. The miracle child survived. Over 85% of domestic violence cases are perpetrated by men. Why? Well, the availability or lack of money has been the root to many evils. And the lack of quality education on social and life skills, poor mental health, and a family history of violence are significant contributing factors. Domestic violence takes on several forms prior to becoming toxic. Emotional abuse, mental abuse, financial abuse, sexual abuse, physical abuse. We need to resist every form of abuse from the onset or it gets increasingly worse. The fear of financial insecurity, the fear of decreased standards of living, and the fear of uncertainty about a children's future causes many domestically abused victims to remain despite heavy warning signs. Co-host and I would have our usual discussions shortly, but for right now, let's watch this special report. Perspectives will be right back. The issue that is regularly brought up with regards to relationships is domestic abuse. Domestic abuse 
is often used as a synonym for intimate partner violence, which is committed by one of the people in an intimate relationship against the other person and can take place in relationships or between former spouses or partners. Domestic violence is any form of maltreatment that takes place in a heterosexual or homosexual romantic relationship between adults or adolescents. It is a pattern of coercive, controlling behavior that is a pervasive life-threatening crime affecting people in all our communities regardless of gender, age, sexual orientation, race, ethnicity, religion, social standing, and immigration status. Abuse is not love. It is one person in a relationship having power and control over the other person. Domestic violence takes many forms, physical, emotional, economic stalking and harassment, and of course, sexual abuse. The physical abuse aspect of domestic abuse does not always leave marks or cause permanent damage. It includes physically hurting someone by scratching, biting, grabbing, shoving, pushing, and so on. Throwing objects to hurt or intimidate a person is also part of abuse. Attacking or threatening to attack with a weapon and any threats or actual attempts to kill someone. While emotional and psychological side of domestic abuse is a behavior your partner uses to control you or damage your emotional well-being. It can be verbal or non-verbal, like name-calling, mocking, intimidation, and making humiliating remarks or gestures. Domestic violence is more than just a relationship issue. It is a crime. Today on Perspectives, we will be focusing on solutions to domestic violence which includes both short and long-term strategies and ways we can prevent domestic abuse. When people hear of domestic abuse, the first thing that they first think is physical. But domestic abuse goes way more than that. There's the emotional, there's the spiritual, there's the financial. And also, when people also think of domestic abuse, you tend to focus on the woman. Yes, 90% of it, or maybe 70, I don't know how it of it are women being abused by men, but there are also men who are also abused by women. I mean, I think I mentioned during my introduction script, the man that was born exactly. alive, the wife put a hot pressing iron on his chest until he was dead. And, and like, like the women too, the family also want the person out of the relationship, but they never leave. Because I remember somebody was telling me how they went to um, the prison near my house. I can't remember. Kirikiri? No, Kirikiri. I live in Ikoi. There's a prison near my house. I've forgotten what the name it is, but she went, she went there to visit. She was doing a documentary on prisoners and what have you. And she met a guy, big looking, baldy guy. And he was there for life because he killed his wife. Mm. <clears throat> she asked him what happened. And apparently he had been abused by his wife for decades. She would attack him with a knife. She pour hot water on him. But he has been stomaching it for so long. And then one day he just snapped and stabbed her, to, literally stabbed her to death. Very quiet demeanor, very calm person. But <clears throat> she, she also brought attention to the fact that women are not the only people that get abused, men also, and parents also get abused too oh, by their course. children. Because you have, especially maybe the mother is a single mother, the guy has grown, he's in his teen, he's at his strongest, he asks for something, she doesn't give it to him, he destroys, I've seen videos of it, where he destroys everything in the house. Even that alone is also domestic abuse. Right, and this is why we tell women or parents who are in domestic violence situations to run, to save their children, it's not as their easy to run. It's not as easy I understand, to run. we'll get to that, but I'm like trying to make a point on the fact that you don't want your dependents to be left behind. The worst cases of domestic abuse for me is the children, are the children mm -hmm. who are left behind, going to stay with some auntie somewhere, some uncle somewhere, and then they get abused, they get brutalized, they get misused, and it becomes a toxic cycle. I mean, we've seen how it can be passed, domestic abuse can be passed on from generation to generation. Mm -hmm. But like you said, it's not easy to run. It's, it's not, like because I don't think any woman 
looks at her situation or any man looks at that situation and but because your self-esteem has also been battered so much so by the time the person comes begging apologizing yeah. i'm sorry i'm this i'm that it weakens you it yeah. weakens your resolve i think it shouldn't even be about that if somebody is brutalizing you and comes to apologize and they do it again but you're assuming, you that, again, the you're assuming that the people are in the right state of mind mm. by the time you've been abused for so long and don't forget i keep saying yeah. abuse is not necessarily physical Mm. Emotional abuse is almost even worse. Mm. Emotional and mental abuse is almost worse. Right, and absolutely. then you are now working on eggshells because you don't know how you will react or whatever. So exactly. aside from rape, aside from physical, there yeah. are also may, more pertinent and more pressing, yeah. equally as pressing issues that a lot of people don't address. These are the ones that are not seen in public. And it gets progressively worse. Of so course. it's like from the onset, when you start seeing the signs, mm -hmm. run. Find mm. shelter, tell people, confine people, get a therapist. But Avoid anyone that will be abusive to you. There are signs of it too. If it calls you crazy, calls you a bitch, calls you really bad names. Oh, well, the people who have putting you down in yeah, public. But, yeah, but I, I, I think trying to reduce your self-esteem. Yes, those are triggers. Yes, mm -hmm. but I think some people go through the triggers thinking things will change, mm. right or wrong. But the bottom line is that when your life is at risk, that is when you really know that you need to go. Yeah, the, if you wait till then, that's the time when you're yeah, actually can give so time. in it. Nobody Maybe can give you time. Maybe you become married or you're sharing homes, you're sharing finances, yeah, you but, have uh, children. What I'm saying is that nobody can give a time. I cannot say, yeah. oh, in three months, if he does this, oh, I'm, I'm out. Right, that's uh, why I say when you see the trigger signs, mm. just run. <coughs> Some people have said <coughs> to avoid it yes. progressing Yeah, I know, but it's, it's not as easy because if it was that easy, then we will not have this issue. Exactly, but it's easier when it's in the earlier stages. I know, but what I'm right. saying is that a lot of people go past that earlier stages exactly. thinking that but things will improve. But if you avoid that, would you like stay in a relationship with someone who's calling you crazy? I've never been abused. Like, I've never been abused. Like that would be just a trigger sign. No well, way. Well, you might stay. <laughs> my mouth is quite sharp, so really I'm not in a position <laughs> to start judging anybody per se. Yeah. But my, the truth of the matter is that there's abuse and there's abuse. Yeah. Do you understand? There are sometimes you, you push each other's buttons, mm -hmm. but it never degenerates to the point where it becomes so vile that even when you find yourself uttering these vile things, yeah. you know, you, you have to say to yourself, are you ready? That means you're ready to throw the baby away with the bathwater because mm -hmm. there must be a limit mm -hmm. to how far you can go in terms of abuse. In Absolutely. terms of physical, in terms of emotional, in Verbal. terms of mental, yes. you know. But what is most painful and why these women stay is the battering of their self-esteem. Absolutely. I mean, we saw the R. Kelly case. I, mean, I look think at it was that. Andrea, when she child. described what she went he was through. A sick. No, there are R. Kelly times chain her on the bed, yes. leave her there to like... What about feces? On the bed, yes. exactly. That was a yeah. very toxic... Her interview was... There are a lot uh, of relationships that are toxic. It was and, so demeaning. You know, we just have to so find demeaning. a way. Anyway, we're headed for a short break, but stay with us when we come back. The conversation around domestic abuse will kick on with our distinguished guests, Jola Grace Emmanuel and Dr. Kemi Ibu. Perspectives will return in just a moment. Welcome back to Perspectives, you're on Arise News. Now on to introducing our guests for today. First off is Jola Grace Emmanuel, who is a certified life coach and trauma recovery coach. Jola Grace is popularly referred to as the soul doctor. She helps trauma victims, the broken, emotionally wounded, and abused people to heal and reinvent themselves for an excellent life. Among several other epaulets on her CV, Jola is a mental health advocate and a certified cognitive behavioral therapist. She has over 15 years of experience in public speaking and training. She went through many years of oppression, pain, and domestic violence and abuse to the extent that she contemplated suicide. She has, however, reinvented herself from a place of pain, low self-esteem, depression, and suicide contemplation to a place of confidence, wholesomeness, fearlessness, and purpose. I love that. Today, her mandate is to help people recover from traumatic experiences, understand relationship dynamics, live their very best lives, develop a healthy self-esteem, as well as boost self-confidence and self-worth for maximum productivity in all areas of their lives. Welcome to Perspectives, Jola Grace. And indeed, and also joining us for the very Thank important you. discussion Thank you so much. is Anita Kemi da Silva Ibru, who is a specialist healthcare physician and consultant specialist in obstetrics and gynecology, as well as a public health physician with over 20 years experience in private practice. 
Dr. Da Silva Ibru's medical and academic career has spanned across three decades and three continents. She is also the founder of the Women at Risk International Foundation, WARIF, a non profit organization that addresses the prevalence of gender based violence, rape, and the trafficking of young girls and women across Nigeria. WARIF is one of the Nigeria's foremost organizations tackling sexual violence. Its goal is to bring about a world in which all women and girls can live their lives free from gender based violence. That Siva Ibru has too many notable national and international awards to mention. She was met, nominated in 2020 as one of the 50 African women in development and also recognized as a CNN, CNN COVID and Heroes Newsmaker. In 2023, she was also the recipient of the Gold Award for Thought Leader of the Year and Silver Award for Women Changing the World category by the Women Changing the World Organization. Great to have you here, Kevin. Thank eh? you very much for having me. Your portfolio is so long. I just had to, you know, deduce it, get <laughs> as little as I could, because I mean, otherwise we'd have been reading all, all, all morning. Thank you, thank but, you. Okay, I mean, you know, like we were discussing earlier, why do women stay in abusive relationships? And then secondly, you also know that apart from women, men are also abused. This is true. And like we discussed earlier too, parents can also be abused by children. Absolutely. So in those three areas, why do you think they are helpless to do anything about it? Well, I mean, first of all, I think we need to remember, like you rightly said, that when we talk about domestic violence, when we use different terminology like gender-based violence, mm -hmm. it's precisely that. It can occur with either gender. Mm -hmm. It can happen to men as well as women. The truth of the matter is, majority of the cases that we have, women are the survivors of these acts of violence. Mm -hmm. And in 90% of cases, men are perpetrators of these acts of violence. But well, it does not mean, as you rightly said, that we don't have male survivors mm -hmm. either. Mm -hmm. And then we ask, well, why do you stay? No one wants to be in a home where she's threatened daily. She's beaten. She has no autonomy of herself, no agency in the house, no decision-making input in anything that occurs. And then she's made to remain silent with repeated acts of violence perpetrated on her. Mm. Well, we have to look at the environment we live in. We live in a patriarchy. We know that. Nigeria is a country where women are naturally subjugated. Mm -hmm. We see that every day in different sectors. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, we have wonderful culture and heritage, but we also have cultural practices that encourage the violence against women and girls. Mm -hmm. And this, again, we see played out every day in many homes. Mm -hmm. What are some of the cultural practices that encourage For violence? instance, you have in certain parts of Nigeria where men are allowed to strike and beat women if, for example, she didn't prepare the house in, to his liking or his food to his liking. Isn't that individual, not cultural? No, there are cultural practices where you take these cases in front of the community leader and you have a woman sit and he mediates over these cases and it's deemed appropriate it's for true. him to strike or for him to be punitive with regards to these acts in his home. Yeah, I've heard, of so, situations, I've heard of situations where a friend of mine who lived in America, for instance, you know, all Americanized mm. idea, blah, blah, she came, comes back with her husband. You know America, before the man even says, before he even lifts up his hand, you're already calling the police. Exactly. So in this case, they had had an argument, and of course, it got, it got physical. She goes to the police station to report, and it, you know, it's disheveled and you know, really, you know, so the police was like, ah, what happened, what happened, what happened? So come and write your statement. And she goes, my husband beat me. And the police was like, your husband beat you. So is that why you now came to meet us? You this expect was in us the US? Now? Yeah, in Nigeria. Nigeria. Uh -huh. So you expect us now to go and meet your husband and arrest him. She, was, she wasn't taken seriously. Sadly, but, and that happens mm, many a time. Because you, know, you have the community. Because there's that mentality of yeah. Right, we have that community shaming. You have yeah. the community blaming. The woman well, it's is expecting. Inefficiencies, though, not necessarily cultural. I don't think it's really uh, maybe, maybe standardly more accepted as a culture for I, that I to happen. I think no, but they're more tolerant. It's usually individual yeah, or the leadership unfortunately, of our, that. Our society is more tolerant of men and their excesses. One, and mm. when we speak to community practices, it's a ripple effect. And so if you have an individual that has been brought up with a certain mindset, steeped in a cultural practice, 
it is going to ripple into his day-to-day -day affairs. He's going to become that police officer behind mm -hmm. the desk mm -hmm. that is listening to this conversation mm -hmm. and bringing that into his office space will turn around and say it's a right. family matter. Right. It has nothing to do with us because he doesn't see it as a crime. He doesn't see it as something that he needs to act on mm -hmm. in this thing, part of the world. Yes. Another thing that makes women also vulnerable is also the financial aspect. Absolutely. Because you see a situation where the man hasn't allowed her to work or has weakened her financially. Because that's also part of abuse, using that's monies to, 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 to suppress the woman. So in a case where a woman now comes to you, for instance, to your NGO, right. and says that, you know, and she's run away from her husband right. and she has left, but she has no money. She doesn't know where to carry the kids to, but yeah. she, she is at her wit's end. What kind of provisions, what temporary measures does your NGO take? So you know, to avoid them returning. Exactly. So at the Warriors Organization, we work under three pillars, one being health. And so we do have a rape crisis center located in Yaba. And it's a walk-in facility. There's no red tape. And all the services that we offer are free. So one of the first things that we look at are medical attention, medical needs of this woman. Many a time, like you rightly said, this woman has endured an act of violence. So she's in need of medical attention. Perhaps in many cases, you would also have an accompanying sexual violence. So mm. perhaps she needs forensic medical examinations carried yeah. out on her. Mm. And then we look at the tests that she needs to have carried out. Because is she now susceptible to HIV? Mm. Does she have an unwanted pregnancy? Does she need the post-exposure drugs to prevent these infections? Mm. And then as equally important as the physical attention is the emotional attention. Right. She needs counseling. She needs someone to sit with her and understand mm. emotionally what she's dealing with. And then because we live in this part of the world, mm -hmm. because a post-incidence facility like a rape crisis center should end there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But in the Nigeria, we do not have ancillary care. She can't mm -hmm. go home mm -hmm. and pick up the phone and call housing. Mm -hmm. exactly. She can't look for legal aid on her own. Mm -hmm. So we have to again offer okay. social welfare. Okay. So we then sit with her and understand what her social welfare needs her. Is she in an abusive home, for instance, like Ruth mm -hmm. said? Does she need to be taken out of that home and moved into a and shelter? If she does, what and that's what we provide. Okay. We the provide the referral the system mm -hmm. that we've already established. How long can this in the shelter? So it varies depending on the criteria of each home or shelter. You have shelters that would offer um, services to not just the woman, but to her children as well. Mm -hmm. Others may also be able to offer this service for an extended period of time. In some mm -hmm. cases, it's a short temporary approach mm -hmm. whilst the woman is then addressing her needs and identifying longer term um, you know, resources okay. that's available to her. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, where's um, Jolla Grace? We want to ask you a question. Kemi, let us let you rest for like two minutes. <laughs> so can we have Jolla Grace? Is she, is she around? Anyway, um, Jolla Grace, what I want to ask you, because you went through abuse. You were even married to a pastor, for crying out loud. So what I want to ask is that how damaged was your self-esteem and your self-worth? How long were you married for and how many times did you leave before your final departure? Each time you left, what made you go back? And aside from the obvious physical assault, can you tell us examples of other forms of abuse? Can you hear us, Jolla? So, so Eric, I think Jola, Jola will be back with Jola in, in, uh, in a minute or two. We have a, a bit of an issue with the line. Okay, Kemi, I want to ask you. You know, um, a lot of abused people, they have loved ones. The loved ones are so in pain when they see their sister, their mother, or whatever goes through this. Like I was giving you an example of the lady who was married with four children. Right. He, had, he, had, he had abused her so many times. Then she finally plucked up courage after encouragement from her support network mm. and left him. While she was away from him, she met this guy, she fell in love with him, she knew what she found, finally discovered what the proper relationship is like, blah, blah, blah. But to the horror of her family, she went back. And of course, that was where she met her death. She was beaten to death. We've heard many instances, even that other singer, I can't remember her name, some gospel singer who was also killed. So what, if, 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 what extreme measures can siblings and family take to remove this person from this situation, if need be? Well, the reality is there's only so much you can do in any situation where you're dealing with a consenting adult who is making yeah, but you know they're not in their choices. right frame of mind. Though. This is true, but at the end of the day, 
as outside of physically restraining them. There are only so many choices that you can take away from this woman. I think the most important thing always we say is you need to believe her. I mean, you assume that that is a given, but in you reality, believe her. believe her story. Believe of that course. you know what's going on. That is an assumption. What do you mean believe her story? She's because been abused. Many, yes, but for many, yes, for many a time, too. you would have situations mm -hmm. where what we find is women struggling to find a platform to speak on this, and no one is actually mm. ready to listen and believe her. Many people are very quick to judge her as to why it is that it's happening to her and placing the responsibility That's unfair, of this. That's unfair, because if my sister totally was abused, totally I would unfair. not, I not so doubt you have, story. So you have a situations where, especially when it comes to the dynamics of marriages and in-laws. It's usually the in-laws. When you have a situation, the, the exactly, of the party, where you have, the when you have a situation where, as many a time is common practice in our part of the world, you have family meetings mm. that are called on for mm. these types of situations. Mm. And the woman is then forced to re, you know, re, re, you know, disclose a lot of the acts mm. that have occurred. And then she's questioned. I think what your foundation is doing is amazing work. Thank you. But I still want to go back to her question on how women are financially helped okay. to avoid them going back to their abuser. Right. So at what stage, when they get into the shelter, for how, how long are they in the shelter for? So, and how are they helped to not go back? So with regards to the provisions that we offer, as I said, in, under the our welfare package, we sit with the woman to identify what her needs are. So in this case, perhaps it's shelter, because you as you rightly said, is that what it not is? necessarily recommendations, we actively follow through a clinical pathway. And one of which is to establish whether or not she needs to be removed from an abusive home. And this is where, like I said, in partnership with ref different referral shelters, we're able to physically move her into that safe space. But well, she can't stay forever. But well, she can't. So at this point in time, this is where, as an organization, we then partner with other organizations to see what other ways that we can assist. We offer vocational okay. skills for many women that sadly didn't get to finish school because, again, her educational you know, trajectory was cut short. And so right now, we talk about her needs. We talk about her financial needs. We've just said that 98% of the time, any form of violence is accompanied with financial abuse. Mm -hmm. A woman does not have the financial wherewithal to leave. And if she has children, it's even worse. And so if you have a woman that didn't finish school and you can't then put her back into a training program, what do you have for her? And this is where vocational skills are so relevant. Because if you empower her, the idea is you're now giving her the self-worth that has been beaten out of her as well as the practical toolkit to be able to leave the home. Well, the reality is, at our organization, 73% of the cases that we see either recant by the time we get through the judicial system, or we find out that, unfortunately, an arrangement back. has been okay. made and the woman has returned to the abusive environment. Okay. We'll get back to you now, because we need to get Jola. Jola, are you there? Do we have Jola now? Yes, I am. <laughs> uh, Jola, how are you? Sorry about the you know, initial whatever. Like I was saying, I said, how long no were you married for? And how many times did you leave before your final departure? Each time that you left, what made you go back? And then aside from your physical assaults, can you tell us ex ex other forms of abuse that are not visible to the eye, but to you yourself, that mm. you went through with your husband or your ex-husband? Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me on your platform. You're looking so amazingly beautiful. So are you. And I love your glasses. Studio. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, I was married for 16 years. Wow. Um, the truth is, I, there are several times that I just ran away. So I wouldn't even say left. So maybe I got so overwhelmed. And I remember a time that I just took a taxi, I didn't know where I was going, and I left the city that I was in. And then when I got to where I was going, I was like, okay, what am I gonna do now? But eventually I'll go back because I'm like, I didn't have any money. Um, I couldn't also tell anybody about what I was experiencing. So a lot of times I would just leave and then I'll go back again and I'm like, okay, I don't want, also want to leave my children, what's gonna happen to them, let me go back. Um, but when it comes to leaving, I left for the first time uh, in 2016, 
And at that point in time, you know, I had some mentors in my life that were, you know, talking to me and helping me sort of maintain my sanity uh, at that point in time. But it got, an event occurred on one of those days that I called one of my mentors and um, she said to me, that's it. Um, you can't stay here again. Uh, she rang my dad. My dad asked me to come home which was uh, a blessing and a gift to me. And I just want to give a shout out to my dad and my mom because uh, even though my dad is an Anglican priest, my dad didn't think that he should uh, make religion uh, be bigger than the life of his daughter. Uh, my dad said to me over and over again during that period that I would rather have a divorced daughter than a dead daughter. Mm. So that was the first time I, I, I left. And um, I was out of there for about two and a half weeks. Um, but then this person came to beg, promised he wasn't going to do that again because I, that that was a big one. Um, I went back again because I thought to myself, um, I there is no, I didn't see any option out of that marriage. I didn't see any way out. I didn't see my existence or my living outside of that marriage because this is what I've been used to. I got married right from NYC married, so I've never really done anything else. I didn't know anything else. Uh, over the years that I was married, I wasn't allowed to work. Um, even though I studied accounting, had uh, a master's in finance, I wasn't allowed to do anything with that. So I was just there, you know, for the 16 years, not knowing who I was, not knowing anything else, apart from being in that marriage, having children and um, helping the man to build his vision and his dream. And so I went back then because I just couldn't see. And also because um, there are some counselors that we were speaking with, you know, at that point in time. And I remember one of them speci specifically told me on one of those runaway episodes that, look, you keep running away. You cannot live without this man. Wow. And I think that sat in my head because, you know, as, as an NLP practitioner, I understand that about 99 of the things we do happens from our subconscious, mm -hmm. our eyes. I say to people that your eyes and your ears are the gateway to your soul. And so the things that you hear, the things that you see, registers, stays inside your soul and, and um, judges the way you do things in life. And so for me, that registered somewhere in my subconscious. So every time even the thought comes, I remember that that man's words to me, you cannot live without this man. And oh, so wow. I'm like, I'm stuck. Even though I know that I made a wrong decision, I'm stuck here. You also oh. said that your, your husband, for instance, got custody of the kids because he was more financially able. Yes. Now, this is a question for both you and Kemi, actually, even though it's a bit legal. If you know, for instance, because at some point in, your, in, in the marriage, you knew you were going to leave, especially when you now made your final exit. So are there little things that you should start yes. to, 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 to collect, to use as evidence when you go to court? You know, like maybe times when he won't let you use your phone or times when he would abuse you, you take a picture of yourself or, you know, just little, little things that you can use to support your case. It, looking back, do you wish that you had done that? And might that have helped you mm. in, your, in your fight for custody of the kids? 100% absolutely. You know, because I, I got, I say to people that when I got married, I got married at a very young age. I was very naive. And a lot of the things that has been ingrained into us while growing up as young girls is be submissive to your husband. You know, once you get married, that's it. You are there for life. Whatever happens, you're just there. So all of that was already inside my mind. So when things began to happen, of course, I did not think that, oh, let me record this. I'm going to need this or anything like that. So, in fact, a lot of, for a while, I was living in denial. Mm. I was telling myself, nah, this can't be happening. You know, the person I married is a pastor. He can't do no wrong. You know, it must be me. Because a lot of times when you are in an abusive relationship, especially if you're married to a narcissist, um, the narcissist makes you believe that the abuse is your fault, mm -hmm. that whatever they do, whatever action they take is your fault. So um, I slapped you because you didn't, you didn't serve my food on time. Mm -hmm. Um, I spoke to you in a rude manner in front of people because you did not answer me on time. I was calling you. So everything that happened, every incident that happened is your fault. It's because of what you did or what you did not do that I reacted like that. And I say to people that you can't, you can't accept that because whatever happened, 
uh, I'm in control of my actions. I cannot control what another person does. Um, if if somebody chooses to react in a certain way, it's not on me, it's on you. You are in control of your actions and your emotions. So for me, over the years, I did not even think that I would need evidence mm. one day. I did not even see myself. In fact, at the point where I left finally, uh, my parents felt, okay, you were, I, I was literally slipping away. And mm. I loved what you said earlier on that it's not just physical abuse that is dangerous. In mm. fact, psychological, emotional mm. abuse Absolutely. is worse mm. because this affects your mind right? Your mind is your greatest asset. And, you know, I was also hearing earlier on when we said, why do some people stay there? Why do women stay there? Um, I'm not sure if you can still hear me. We can hear <laughs> Let you. Let me know if you can still hear me because looks yeah, as Yeah, we're totally in sync. We can hear you. Uh, it's been disconnected again. No, 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 we can hear you. Can you still hear me? Yes, we can. Go on, Grace. We can hear you. That was you can hear me. Okay. Yes, All right. You. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. So I was saying that a lot of times before the perpetrator starts abusing you. All right. Okay. Sorry. I'm just. <laughs> Don't worry. You get used to our jobs. <laughs> <laughs> can you hear me? Yes. 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 We can hear you. We can hear you, Jola. All right. Okay. So I was saying that a lot of times before the perpetrator starts abusing you, they start working on your mind. Yes. Right? They manipulate your mind. So they will love bomb you at the beginning. They will show you so much love. And then they will start telling you things. I'm the only one that loves you. Mm -hmm. I'm the only one that cares about you. They will tell you your family members don't really care. Your loved ones don't really care. That those friends around you, they are not really, they don't, they're not really looking for your best interest. And so they get your mind to be conditioned to the fact that you are the only one. And they are the only one that truly cares about you. So when the abuse starts, they will tell you things like, well, I did this because I love you. I did this because I really cared about you. It's, it's really for your own good. And so you also are conditioned to that mm -hmm. fact that, oh, this person loves me. That's why they are doing what they are doing. And see, mind conditioning is so, so, so powerful mm -hmm. so that over the years, when the abuse aggravates, right, you can't even, your mind stops functioning the normal way everybody's mm -hmm. mind Logically. functions. Yeah. So when people are look at you from the, from looking at you from the outside and saying, this man is going to kill you, this man is hurting you, mm -hmm. you are not reasoning like that. Because over the years, you're, you have been brainwashed. Let me use that mm -hmm. word. Mm -hmm. Your mind has been, has been messed up to reason and believe in a different way all around this person. So when I left, when I finally left, I just let my parents just felt, look, you're, lo you're, you're looking like a shadow. You're looking as if you're going to drop dead any minute from now. And literally at that point in time, I was like a zombie. I was, I was so, my soul was dead mm. at that point in time. So I left just to get some hair. I left like, let me just breathe, you know, let me just heal. Let me just come back and just, uh, you know, let me just find that time to find myself again. Uh -huh. So there was nothing like guarding of evidences or that I was going to need it at any point in time because I did not think that um, I would be sat here but today so, hopefully whoever is watching you know, this, facing this. Whoever but, is I was, watching but that this was one of the mistakes I believe I made. So I would say uh -huh. to people that if you begin to see, if you are at that point in time where you have known that, okay, this is abuse, right? You have all the, you have all the flags. You, 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 you've gone, you've seen it over and over again happening. And that one day, I might have to be in a court where I want to fight for the custody of my children. You need to start keeping Thank you, things. Jola. I found and her phone record to do a lot of text messaging, you know, emails. Thank you, Thank you Jola. There we'll because back, we'll back <laughs> if you're soon. dealing with a narcissist, it is going to be your word against them. Thank and you they, so they much. So, they have charisma. So they, when they talk to you, to other people about you, people, will, if I, I was saying jokingly that if, if, my ex told me about me and I was not me. I would not even like it, <laughs> right? Because of how convincing they can be. So yes, you need those evidences. You need those things to begin to put them together so that you can, you know, have a strong standing when it comes to uh, custody of your children. Okay, thank you so much, Jelena. We're going to go on break, but don't leave us. We'll be back. We'll be right back with Perspectives. Welcome back to Perspectives. Kemi, you know, Jala was talking about, when I asked her about, you know, things that you can do to collect, evidence that you can yeah. collect, 
But you know, when you really have to break it down, what do you what does it literally mean? Does it mean anytime he hits you, take a picture? What about if he doesn't hit you, but he abuses you in other forms? The truth is, first I have to commend Jola. Jola is Jola's story is yeah, amazing. Yeah, very commendable. Jola is a strong woman that has made it through, mm -hmm. and her testament, her her story, platforms like this are necessary so other women can hear. Yes. And whether it's and we a hope year, it the 10 years, 16 mm -hmm. years, there is that light at the end of the tunnel. Mm. And it's very difficult. We were just sharing to, at the point in time that you're being actively attacked, to have the wherewithal to know, oh gosh, I need to now take a picture mm. after he hits me. Mm. Or I need to journal what has happened. Mm. But the truth is, unfortunately, the law is the law. And when you have evidence-based information, when you have written down documentation, when you have an eyewitness account, maybe your housemaid has witnessed it and has seen him drag you across the floor. Mm -hmm. Maybe after an attack, you've called a friend to help you go to the hospital. Mm -hmm. Maybe the medical records in that hospital is going to be used mm -hmm. in that court of law. Maybe the pictures that are taken of your injuries when mm -hmm. you're seen. But it's hard to say to a woman dealing with acts exactly. of violence, especially in a gaslit situation. As Jola rightly said, you're blaming yourself. So you're internalizing everything that's happening. You're saying, well, what did I do today mm. to make him angry to hit me? Mm. But the truth is, if you're going through the court of law, so I'm not a trained journal, lawyer, basically. but journals, you know, pictorial evidence, historical evidence. Mm -hmm. It's one thing to say that I've been in a marriage 16 years and he started hitting me from day one. Mm. It's another thing to say, well, this is my diary from 16 years ago, and I put an entry right. when I was sad because the day before he hit me. Right, so, so you see how very prevalent domestic abuse is in Nigeria. So my big thing in perspectives is to find out the causal and try to prevent the cause rather than treating and helping and looking for help and scampering. And I think I really enjoyed when Jola was speaking and really spoke about how it was financial issues that caused her to stay. She was so young, she had just finished NYSE, she was in a marriage, she was suppressed. How can women prevent financial setbacks prior to getting into marriages? Well, I mean, I think listening to Jola, What yes. if you married very young? Yeah, like I mean, she you, did. It's very so late. You married that young? Well, well, I mean, I mean it's it's but there are people who have married young. Financially yeah, but there are people who have married young, yeah. and they have they've led very happy marriages. Mm -hmm. I think an abuser is an abuser. Whether you marry him I was young just about or marry to say him that old. society spends so much time yeah. trying to find out why it happened to her, mm -hmm. as opposed to spending equal amounts of time What's understanding why the abuser is who he is. Absolutely. So yes, we can sit mm -hmm. here and spend hours trying to understand what would be the ideal situation. Generational should abuse, she, well, she intergenerational abuse is one aspect, or you could have an isolated incident. You could have a situation where mm -hmm. a woman brings in the baggage of her abuse from childhood. Mm -hmm. And so we know that when it comes to grooming, yeah. and you look through, and this is certainly not speaking of um, all marriages, mm -hmm. but when you have abusive marriages and relationships, and you sit down and you have a conversation in a counseling session with many women, they can tell you perhaps the triggers. Maybe the it was triggers. because their parents had mm. an abusive relationship mm -hmm. and then this stayed with her. So she became accustomed to the yes, fact that she had to natural. adopt a submissive role. Right. And this could be a woman that's a CEO yes. in a C-suite um, yes. environment mm -hmm. who is strong and seen to be totally in control. Mm -hmm. What I will find most amusing is that when you see successful women like that, you cannot but wonder you know, how they can be in such an abusive relationship. But even aside from that, is this thing called restraining order? Does it even work in Nigeria? Yes, it does. Yes and no. The problem with Nigeria, in my opinion, is not so much do we have the laws, mm. because we do have laws. The question is always how well are these laws implemented? Exactly. For instance, when you talk about laws that protect women and men against domestic violence, we have our constitution, our basic federal constitution that says, okay. you know, everybody deserves to have respect and dignity, and of course preventing acts of torture and you know, degradation towards them. We so you have said restraining violence works. No, we're saying that the it exists. laws it exists, exist, but it's not really practical. The challenge I have is are they being adequately work, really implemented? Mm -hmm. And that's where I have an issue with right. it. Mm -hmm. So I was just itemizing the different laws that we have available. So for instance, we have a VAP Act. I'm sure we've all heard of the VAP Act. You spoke of rape last week. And the Violence Against Prohibition of, um, Act in Nigeria 
has been adopted by 33 states. Oh. It's a good law. It protects women and men, both in public though. and private lives. It helps to identify even what would be the offenses, and it goes further to tell you, if convicted, what the legal um, ramifications of that is. In domestic violence, for instance, if you're convicted, up to three years in prison. Okay, but what happens when now, an, ex, the question is, an, an ex breaks the restraining order? So you do have... What's the punishment for Now, that? different laws are applicable in different states. And so it all depends on where you reside. In Lagos State, for instance, there is such a thing as a protection against domestic violence law. Uh -huh. Applicable only in Lagos State. Okay. In my opinion, it's another great law. Why? Mm -hmm. Because it okay. encompasses men, women, and children. So okay. can a woman really get a restraining order she and is call allowed the police under if this law. the man breaks it? Under okay. this but law. But is it actually being implemented? That's the issue that we're discussing here. Anyway, and Jola, that's my challenge. So mm. Where is Jola? But we do have it under this law. We do have okay. a pr temporary protection order yeah. that a woman can go and okay. get from a magistrate court. Mm -hmm. And it can be given to her directly. Mm -hmm. It can even be actually given to an individual that is standing in for her because he or she is concerned for her well-being. Okay, yeah, I can yeah. actually go into a court and say, on behalf of Ruth, okay. I would like to That's then to ask know. exactly That's for a temporary protection order. Okay. The question, of course, is the okay. timelines. How soon can we get exactly. them? Mm. Can they be implemented? And if mm. he breaks it, right. okay. what, happens? what happens? Thank you so much, Kemi. Mm. Where's Jola? Let's give Jola one last question. before Jola, sorry, we, we lost you for a bit. Now, you know, you said your husband was a pastor. Yeah, I'm here. Right. Yes, you said your husband was a pastor, yes. if I recall. So, most churches, most people yes. feel that churches should be cancelled. Church members should be counselors, they are doctors and everything. But I've heard of situations where the church doesn't necessarily have all the answers. Sometimes it goes past what God said or what God didn't say. We all believe in God, yes. So do you feel in your own situation, for instance, that the church did not play the kind of role that you needed at that point in time when you were relying on them? for advice and solace. Briefly, just one, one, one minute, if you can com encompass it very briefly for us. Sorry, can you, can you repeat the question, please? I said, when you were married to a pastor, so clear. You were, can you hear me now? Yes. You were married to a pastor. Yes. And as such, every time you had issues, you, con you, you, you went to church to talk to your senior members of the church. But from experience, churches do, are not professionals who are best to handle situations like this. So in your situation, mm -hmm. when you went to the church mm -hmm. to talk, complain about your husband's beating and the abuse in your marriage, do you feel that they played enough role or it, was, it would have been better for you to have sought professional help than the church? Just one minute because we're, we're running out of time. Thank you, thank you. That's, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, for me, um, I, I believe that I could have gone for professional counseling and therapy at that point in time because the truth is, yes, pastors are amazing, mm. but if you're not equipped, right, to be able to counsel or give therapy in that area, then you should refer them to somebody that can. Mm. Because I believe that one of the reasons why I also stayed for so long was because every time, you know, there was, we went for counseling and all of that, it was told to keep praying, keep me sub submissive. The issue was not dealt with as what it is because abuse is a criminal offense. Mm -hmm. Offense is actually not a religious issue. Mm. So I believe that uh, people should be referred to therapists and coaches that can actually help them uh, to recover or to heal and to get the necessary help they need when it comes to abuse. Well, thank you very much, Jola. You've been so, I mean... You couldn't have presented a better, you couldn't have done a better job than you have done now. And I really hope that you have touched a chord of one or two people who are in your situation and begging for answers. I love your confidence and I pray that you continue to stand strong and be an advocate for this menace in our society. Kemi, Indeed. I cannot thank you enough. I was going to discuss children who also abuse their parents. But I guess we'll look for a part two for that because there's, no, there's no time. We're, we're running against time. But thank you so much for your words of experience. And what are the hotlines? What are the numbers so we that we can call? We do have hotlines. Um, Warif has a 24-hour helpline. It's an 0800 number. Mm. It's 0800 9210 0009. So 0800 9210 0009. 0800 9210 0009. 
Thank yeah. you so much, Kemi. Thank you for having thank me. You, thank, thank you, thank you, Kemi. We hope to thank see you, you again Kemi. soon. Okay. Anyway, that was a very compassionate discussion that we had. I just pray that, you know, people learn one or two things from this, as always. Abuse is like a tree. It grows from attitudes and values, not feelings. The roots are ownership. The truck is entitlement. And the branches are control. Being in an abusive relationship is like being kidnapped and tortured for ransom, but you can never have enough time to pay up the kidnapper. But there comes a time when you have to fully convince yourself that against all odds, whatever it takes to do so, you have the power to say this, and it's not how, this is not how your story is going to end. Please always remember that life is a learning club. And thanks once again for being with us on Perspectives. I am Ruth Osime. And I am Ola Torera Majekudumi Oniru. Pure love and romance is such a beautiful thing that every human deserves to experience continuously. But when it becomes abusive, please run. Protect your heart, your life, and your dependents. There are 7 billion people in our world today and lots of opportunities for you to live your very best life. Avoid being stuck on any person, opportunity, or home to the point where it becomes toxic. Push your dreams smartly and you will overcome every challenge. Thank you for watching Perspectives. Thank you to our special guests for joining us today. Have a great, great weekend and see you all soon. Goodbye.